So thank you for for joining me. I'm super excited to have you because I'm like I've been a big fan of your books. So Paul McGee is one of the UK's leading motivational speakers, seminar presenter, communication coach, and best-selling author. He has lectured across forty countries and is the founder of Shut Up, Move On on Sumo, a life coaching program that draws on cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy. And we're looking at the book How to Speak So People Really Listen. The Straight Talking Guide to Communicating with Influence and Impact, which I definitely need. So I've got to ask, like, you've written an amazing amount of books, like, as I can see in the background as well. So what made you write this one in particular? I think there was, I've done a lot of speaking and it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me as your guest. I think I've done a lot of different topics like how to succeed with people, self-confidence, how not to worry, and obviously sumo, sure up and move on. But I've done a lot of um, events around communication and how to raise the bar, raise the game, if you like, and raise the bar in terms of how we can communicate with influence and impact. And so I'd almost come to the point where I thought, do I want to write another book? But Mm. I knew I had something to say on this topic. Mm. So given that lots of people were attending my master classes and were seeking one to one coaching, I thought, okay, the ideas I have, I'm not going to be around forever, but if I can put down some ideas and principles that I think will last well beyond I last, Mm. then then I'll definitely do that. And so that happened. The book's done really well. It's used in a variety of different contexts, not just in the UK, but abroad as well. But it was, Mm. I'm very much of don't write a book unless you've got something to say. And I felt on the subject of how to speak to people really listen, which has got a a bias towards presenting, particularly in public speaking. Mm that um, I definitely had something to say. Yeah, and actually I had to ask because I- I'm sure like everyone's gone through this, but have you ever had a moment where you were just rendered completely speechless? Not necessarily when I'm stood up speaking, but I think there are times when I'm doing a one-to-one and, and someone will <clears throat> will will um, ask a question that I've just not ever thought about before and I wouldn't I rendered speechless, but what that really means often is I'm having to take time to pause and to stop mm. and to think and to reflect. Um, so I think some people will, you know, have that experience at times, but it's not something that's been too common for me, fortunately. Yeah, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, I, I'm assuming having to ha- speak all the time to so many different audiences, it, it that would be really, really hard to deal with. Yeah, there's been the odd one. I've done a, <clears throat> a training workshop. And I, I, I mean, if I can if I can go slightly adult in inverted commas with this comment, I once said to went was, I was doing a workshop. So it wasn't me being a speaker, it was me or a facilitator. And I went around the group and I said, OK, look, just it'd be good to know a little bit about you. And I said something you uh, enjoy doing or are good at. So because often we say, what's a hobby or an interest? People mm-hmm. go, I haven't got a hobby or an interest. So, you know, so tell us something that you enjoy or that you're good at. And people said, oh, well, I enjoy my football or I enjoy my DIY. And we mm-hmm. got to this woman who would I'd been chatting to earlier and it seemed quite a quiet, shy woman. And all of a sudden I went, OK, so and, and what, what about you, Claire? Uh, something you enjoy or are good at? She said, well, I enjoy sex, but I don't know how good I am at it. I think that is fair to say. I was speechless for a few seconds. With that line. I wasn't expecting that to appear out of her mouth. That's for sure. That's hilarious. Uh, oh my god. Um, it's, you know, hats off to the woman for being honest. Jeez. I tell um, you, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, it is interesting, just as an aside, how people do actually feel when they're put in a position where they've suddenly got to present. So uh, uh, that story reminds me of another story where I was doing a presentation skills workshop and the woman turned up and she was really confident and really chatty. We weren't talking about anything dodgy, I promise you. And, and, and I thought she's going to be a really strong presenter. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, when it came to actually then presenting later on, she transformed into a completely different person. But she wasn't that bubbly, bouncy confident person I've been chatting to over coffee Mm. and it was almost like hearing that now you've got to give a speech or a presentation it almost like messes with the wiring in our head and we become very very different and hers was quite a dramatic story because she said to me I hate presenting that much 
that I was actually going to work to do a work presentation and I deliberately um, basically caused an accident between me and a bollard in my car and there wasn't too much damage. I didn't in any way endanger myself or anyone else, but I just did it. I deliberately crashed my car in order that I could ring work and go, I'm really sorry, I've been involved in an accident. Oh. I won't be in today. And, oh. and yet, amazingly, we did this work together. And it would have happened whether it be me or somebody else, I'm sure. But I just, it was as much about mindset as about the message that she needs to put across. A lot around the most important, I would say, besides God, if you believe in God, the mm. most important person you're actually ever going to talk to is yourself. Yeah. And, and if we can get those conversations good and more co constructive, then I think that that's really almost like the starting point to being a great, a great presenter and communicator is mm. the conversations you have with yourself. Oh, my God. Yeah, because, Paul, I wanted to ask you, because I think that you're right. One of the worst things I find is the inner critic. And I was like, how do you stop your, your inner critic like undermining your confidence? I think it's <clears throat> sumo we know can stand for shut up, move on. But it can also stand for stop, understand, move on. Mm. And one of the things we need to appreciate is that there's a part of our brain Sometimes, sometimes I refer to it as like your mom's, like your primitive emotional brain. And its primary purpose is about keeping you alive. Not about keeping you happy, but keeping you alive, safe, secure, away from threats. And we need to stop and understand about our evolutionary past and that here we are in 2021. But the fact is the most influential dominant part of our brain is a brain that evolved to help us survive and succeed yeah. on the savannah. 200,000 years ago. So I say all that because when for some people, for a lot of people, in fact, when you want to stand up and speak, that is seen almost by our brains potentially as, oh, this is a bit of a psychological threat. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's not going to be a physical threat. No one's going to attack us when we stand up and speak. But there is this, this belief, and it's perhaps an understandable one, I'm now about to be judged. Hmm. And also, when you think about our, our you know, we, we all come from tribes, hmm. and when someone would stand up 200,000 years ago in front of the rest of the tribe, all eyes are on that person. It's like that puts that person in a potentially very threatening position. Are they trying to, um, you know, sort of like usurp the authority of the, the leader of the tribe, what they're trying to do, and all eyes are on this person, and there's all there's lots of pressure. And if you kind of go, okay, so I need to understand that here I'm in 2021 in the world I'm in, but I've got a primitive emotional brain that evolved to help us survive and succeed on the savannah two thousand years ago, and it wants to protect me mm. and to keep me safe and avoid threats. So sometimes you could argue that that inner critic that I often say that voice inside your head highlights your weaknesses, undermines your confidence in one way is maybe being critical because it's trying to protect you. Mm. It's trying to say, no, don't do that. Right. Don't don't take that risk. Don't take that courageous decision. Don't make that courageous choice. Stay in your comfort zone. Blend in with the crowd. Don't stand up. Don't speak out. Don't let your voice be heard mm. because what if dot 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 because for a lot of people it, until they get used to it and it becomes something that is more of a norm mm. standing up giving a speech or giving a presentation in front of other people particularly their peers psychologically can be a real challenge which is why some people do all they can to avoid it like crash your car other people, perhaps more in a social setting, like at a wedding, uh, mm. are relying on alcohol to get them through the experience. But is that inner critic, maybe it's like a well-meaning friend. It's trying to be helpful, but actually in being helpful, it ends up harming us, if that makes a bit of sense. Mm. So I don't like to see my inner critic as something bad. It's almost like mm. its motives are good, but actually the outworking of it isn't always helpful. And for me... I talk about we need to learn to listen more to our inner coach rather than our inner critic. Mm, yeah. And our inner, our inner coach encourages us and will still challenge us, 
But the, the critic, if we're not careful, can also criticise us as a person. Yeah. You're no good. You're hopeless. What do people think of you? Whereas hopefully the inner coach might say, Paul, that, that didn't go so well. What, would you, what can you learn from that? What would you do differently next time? But the coach focuses hopefully more on the performance, whereas the inner critic can sometimes focus very much more on the person. Hmm. And that isn't always helpful. Yeah, no, totally. And I think you said this really interesting thing about people who, you know, who have that crazy confidence where they they just feel like, oh, I can just go up and do it without needing any practice. So, like, how do you find that balance between like the confidence, complacency and timidness? Yeah, it is. It's an interesting question, because in um, my book I wrote called Self-Confidence, I talk about the interplay between competence and confidence. Mm. And, and some people just have, for whatever reason, are just very confident and have a shared load of belief in themselves. But they may also lack uh, self-awareness. Uh, and, and sometimes, though, confidence can get you through the door. And it encourages you to push the door in the first place. But mm. how far it will take you into the room once you've opened the door is another thing because you need competence. So for me, I, I don't know, it, we can, it's not an easy one to analyze, but I think for myself, I, I talk about in the book about set the seven sins of speaking. Mm. And one of them is around winging it and being complacent. And I think for myself, it's a question of, um, you know, I don't want to over prepare, but I want to have prepared mm. what I'm going to be saying. I need to be not necessarily I've got a script in mind, but I need to have, you know, as I say, the more you think of your audience, the more they'll think of you. Mm. So it's not a question of turn up last minute, full of confidence. Yeah, but that confidence could derail you and lead to arrogance. Yeah. So I, so I think too much confidence can lead to complacency. And mm. in fact, one of the things I think I talk about in the book is the enemy of excellence is not being uh, mediocre. The enemy of excellence is being fairly good. So if excellence mm. is up here and mediocre is there, then there is a clear sign. We've got a bit of a gap. Yeah. So that's not the enemy of excellence because, you know, I need to work really hard. Yeah. If you're up here and you're fairly good and you go, I'm not as bad as a lot of people then do you make the extra effort to become excellent? Very often you don't. So it's, it's an interesting journey to navigate. You'll hear this phrase used a lot about in, imposter syndrome. Oh, God, yeah. That, but, but the thing, and also, can we reframe that? Because I was made a visiting professor at the University of Chester mm. in 2019, <clears throat> and I felt very uncomfortable with the title. Um, for whatever reason, I'd written a book that became a Sunday Times bestseller. And because I'd written quite a few books, it kind of, I was fine with it. But a visiting professor, I'm, I, I'm not really a great, I'm not going to produce academic papers. Mm. I'm, I'm more of a, a pragmatist. I'm more about making ideas that sometimes could be complex, accessible. And so I had a real issue and I didn't use the term to describe myself for, for nearly 18 months. But does imposter syndrome, it can derail you. But could it also mean that you avoid becoming complacent and you go, do I deserve to be, have this title and this be in this role? And mm. could that in some cases be a catalyst? You know, could your doubt be the fuel you need to work even harder? Mm. And, and I would now, particularly because I'm positioned not so much just with my communication, my stuff on communication, but particularly around well-being, resilience and yeah. leadership. I have spent a lot of time researching those areas. And, and, and you could say, oh, self, you know, imposter syndrome, bad, bad, bad. Hey, is it possible that sometimes feeling that I maybe shouldn't be in this role is the catalyst for you wanting to improve yourself so mm. that you feel more justified in the role that you've got. And for me, I would say a bit of self-doubt and maybe even a bit of imposter syndrome has worked for me rather than mm. against. See, that's interesting, Paul, because for me, I've always been super perfectionistic. And I think, you know, I was just wondering, like, where's the line between being really demanding on yourself and wanting to be the best? 
I think there is a difference between excellence and perfectionism. And, and perfect means it cannot be improved upon. Mm. Well, I think everything that I do and say and write could always be improved upon. Mm. And I think also it goes back to asking yourself, so why am I such a perfectionist? What drives yeah. that? Is there an insecurity? And I'm not trying to talk specifically about yourself, but is there something within my upbringing that I got a lot of affirmation when I achieved? Well, I want to be loved for who I am, not simply for what I achieve. And it's great when people celebrate your success and are proud of you. Mm -hmm. But I think for some people, the demands they place on themselves are almost still a desire to prove themselves mm -hmm. to themselves and to prove their worth and value to other people. And I think sometimes I just have to accept, look, it's learning to become OK with me, to become OK with my flaws and my failings. As, as well as my fantastics, if you like. So there's certain things I do feel I'm fundamentally flawed. I do mm. have my failings, but also think I'm capable of some fantastic stuff. And I think some people will only learn to accept themselves and almost like love themselves when they feel they're fantastic in every area of their life. Mm. The fact is we're human and we won't be fantastic in every area of our lives. So can I accept myself? Can I aim for excellence, which is great and wanting to try and improve? But do I put so many great demands on myself that I'm constantly pursuing perfection and never arriving and therefore feeling I'm never good enough? I mean, mm. it's a short question you've asked, but it's a really complex one to un un unpack, really, and to unpick because there's quite a lot potentially going on at a subconscious level that mm. we need to be aware of. Definitely, because, you know, I feel like it, probably not just me, but sure, lots of women as well feel this constant perfectionistic bar, you know, that they have to strive towards. And I was just wondering, like, you know, when you have like this much fear, I was just wondering, where do you even start as a, as a starting point uh, to just trying to get over those sort of basic fear? Because I think I'm a bit like your friend with the bollard, which is, yeah. you know, I, I will like literally throw up before and then throw up afterwards and then just be ill for the rest of the day. <laughs> so that's how bad it can get. So I'm just wondering, yeah. how do you even get over that, that, that initial fear to just start speaking? I think, well, I mean, first of all, you're doing the podcast, so you're doing a great job anyway. And I think it is sometimes, it's also about stopping and understanding a bit about why do I fear, have experienced this fear? It's, it's maybe it's <clears throat> fear of what people will think of me. Mm -hmm. are you really fearful of speaking or is it more about fear of rejection mm -hmm. fear of looking stupid fear of being embarrassed you know those could be it's actually is it really speaking or is it more what mm -hmm. people's reactions might be to That's you true. speaking that that could come into play and just stopping on also having those kind compassionate conversations with yourself and saying okay so i recognize mm -hmm. that my my inner critical my fear um, is it has been activated because it's trying to protect me and it's actually saying there could be a threat here mm. so almost like having a conversation with yourself going okay that's fine thanks fear it's almost like you're driving a car and you've got fear and anxiety on the back seat and uh, but but make sure they're not driving the car they're in the back seat mm. and, and just it's the you know it's our adrenaline the cortisol that is released our fight and flight responses or freeze fight and flight responses triggered and it's, it's just this sense of okay i need to understand what's going on in me now this isn't mm -hmm. just i've got a fear of public speaking what do i do yeah. it's, it's learning to accept where do these fears come from what are they all about are they trying mm -hmm. to protect me guess what i'm not the only one who's ever had this experience yeah and there's a branch of um well, a therapy called ACT, A-C-T, hmm. Acceptance Commi Commitment Therapy, and a great book written by a guy called Russ Harris called The Happiness Trap. And, and one thing that they argue is that within, when you are feeling some degree of anxiety, whether it's about speaking, going out, meeting new people, whatever, is that we try and fight it and we label it as bad. Hmm. And part of acceptance commitment therapy is 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 accepting okay this is how i'm feeling right now and these feelings are valid and mm. that's okay and my anxiety is trying to warn me that there could be something that's a threat 
Mm. And you might need to just say, well, actually, maybe there isn't a threat, but you think there could be. And that's OK, anxiety. And thanks, fear, because you are trying to protect me right now. Mm. And fear, I owe my very existence to fear, because if on the African savanna two hundred thousand years ago, you and I are on a hunting trip and we see all these grazing gazelles and we're going, isn't this great? We can cancel our Tesco's click and collect order. No big shop at Aldi this weekend. Look at all this food. <laughs> now, if you've got any vis- vis- um, listeners or people watching in now who are vegetarians, I do apologise, but gloomy burgers weren't available at the time. But you're kind of like you're in a good place. And then all of a sudden you say to me, Paul, there's a saber tooth tiger. Now, and I'm like going, oh, there's a saber tooth tiger. Oh, fascinating. Now, at that point, the best thing that I could feel and you could feel would be a degree of fear. Yeah. Mm. Not feeling positive, not feeling super calm. Mm. Our lives are in danger. You want that freeze, fight or flight response to be triggered. Mm. And the adrenaline to be released and the cortisol because it's helping you to survive. So maybe we start with just trying to understand more about the benefits of fear and maybe the benefits sometimes of some anxiety in certain situations and develop a relationship with our anxiety and fear Mm. that is based on some understanding and awareness rather than seeing fear and anxiety is always our enemy Mm. of course it can become our enemy but it's it's there trying to help us if we could only realize that and so I think it's about reframing what we even think about those two words fear and anxiety to begin with so Mm. I think that would be a really interesting start and uh, maybe for some people just diving into things like acceptance commitment therapy or obviously cognitive behavioral therapy and Mm. and, and think about those kind of things that's one that's one thing to start with but then also you know in the book self-confidence I talked about confidence is situational Mm. you see you ask me now and say look Paul in an hour's time you've got to do a a presentation to 5,000 people I'm like bring it on if you also said to me um Paul, um, I know it's your birthday tomorrow, um, but your wife isn't able to make a cake, but we need you to make a cake. And um, it it is, you're going to have loads of friends around and they will be judging you on your ability to make that cake. I'm fine with the 5,000 people because I'm competent, I'm experienced. Mm -hmm. And from the feedback I've had from others, I know it's, I'll do well. Mm -hmm. And I probably got to do a presentation I've given given before so I'm well prepared Hmm. so that confidence but it's situational because now I've got to make a cake I've never made a cake before I don't exactly know what I'm doing um and and can you see how my confidence changes Mm -hmm. because of my lack of competence and experience so going back to how do we deal with our fear of speaking understand and become more aware of of what fear and anxiety is and why it's trying to help you that's one aspect, but then get some ideas and some tools, whether it's from my book, other people's books, from about, okay, well, how would I go about developing my confidence and my competence to speak? Mm-hmm. And, and that, that could be something else. And, and again, baby steps. Yeah. You know, when, when we're learning to walk, we don't take giant leaps. And neither when we're learning to walk do we fall and think, I'm mad enough of this, speak, of this walking lark, I'll stick to crawling. Mm. We keep on persevering and getting better and better. So there's a that's some food for thought just to keep you go to kind of like kick things off, really. Yeah, no, for sure. And I feel that's the same with even, you know, talking to groups like one on one is fine. You know, it's absolutely fine. But once you start talking to a group, you know, in a presentation sense, I, I have to have everything written down. Um, so I was just wondering, like, how do you do that without actually having to read something? Because I feel like my brain just sort of goes off somewhere. Can't read anything. Everything becomes a blur. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, how do you do that? You are experiencing. There is there's there's a phrase. And again, you, you that your viewers and your listeners may want to um, look this up called the amygdala hijack. And that's when that primitive emotional part of your brain literally 
releases so much cortisol and adrenaline into your system you it's almost like you can't think straight mm. i have this phrase stress makes you stupid drugs and alcohol will also do that but stress can make us stupid yeah and so there is you know learning and we're not going to get this in a short podcast but there is it's rather than going this is me this is how i am this is bad mm. and it's hopeless it's like going welcome to being human the yeah. challenges you and struggles you face millions of other people face <laughs> maybe learning a bit more about breathing and relaxation techniques could help mm. also almost like look thinking about your audience in, mm. in a way that above all i'm here to serve and help my audience with whatever i've got to say today it's not so much about impressing them and trying to get their approval and acceptance i'm just trying to share some stuff that will be of value to them i'm trying to serve them and i think we can create so much internal pressure on ourselves that can lead to that what i call the amygdala hijack that can cause almost like the rational part of our brain to almost like shut down as we become very very stressed and overwhelmed and that's when you can find that um, for some people that their, their, their skin flushes and, mm. and suddenly it's like these red rashes appear or they do literally um, lose their ability to speak uh, and their mouth becomes incredibly dry. And, and again, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah, that's me. OK, just understand that there's some things happening here, um, but but there are there are tools but it's not one magic wand, but there are a series of tools and insights to start to help you to help yourself. Mm. Like breathing, like learning to relax, like also thinking, so I'm here to serve my audience and why am I putting myself under so much pressure? A question I often ask myself about a lot of issues is, okay, on a scale of one to 10, where mm. 10's death or the end of the world, where is this issue? Yeah. And, mm. and, and just like, I think I need to have a conversation with myself here and get things in perspective, but then also I need to be well prepared. But I would, you know, so it's little things like that. And I think, again, why do we want to write things down? I understand the reason for it is we don't want to get anything wrong. Mm. want to make sure we've remembered everything. But I think over time, this journey of speaking and presenting can lead to one where you start to enjoy what you're doing mm. um, rather than, I think it's just the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Oh, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, because I actually wanted to ask, because obviously, you know, we're all kind of stuck at home at the moment. And, you know, how do you find or talk to or find out who your audience is when you can't actually see the faces of the people you're like talking to? Sure. Now, from my experience, I I will only be speaking typically to um, audiences where I've had a briefing call about the event. So I might, so I've just done an event in Singapore this morning. Ooh. It's been pre-recorded. It'll go out on September the 9th. And, um, but they're telling me a bit about the audience to begin with, but they, I did have a couple of people interview me, but it, mm. I didn't see the audience, but I'm also, here's why they're here. Here's the theme. Mm. Um, here's some of the challenges some people are facing, you know, whether I'm working with the school, the NHS, GlaxoSmithKline, a car dealership, mm. all the kind of, so people are telling me more about the worlds of my audience. So I don't mm. get to see their faces always. In fact, very often I don't. But I'm getting to understand more about they're struggling with this. They've got a challenge with that. There's, mm. there's problems about home life and work life. Right. And so I try and find out as much as I can about my audience. Now, when I'm doing my events, my, my worst case scenario is literally where the screen is blanked and all I do is look at this camera and that's mm. it. What I love is when people say, you're on it too. We're asking delegates to join us from, say, 1.45 onwards. You're welcome to join early. Well, I mm. do. And I join early and people got the cameras on. And then we're going, hey, Dave, hey, that, what's that picture on your wall, mate? Yeah. Tell me a bit about that. And I start to see some of my audience and I engage with them before I've officially started. Mm. But there are times when that isn't the, the opportunity there isn't an opportunity to do that either to do with a platform that's being used or people don't want their um yeah. cameras on and i've just learned i guess it just becomes a learned behavior like you learn to do lots of things in life that i am not even looking at the screen so at the moment i'm not really looking at you hmm. i'm looking at the camera my webcam oh. attached to the top of my um laptop but by looking at the camera 
I'm now giving you the impression I'm looking at you. Yeah. So mm. does that make sense? Whereas if I do this. Yeah, because uh, that's the thing. Exactly. I'm now seeing you. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you in your eyes, but you don't think I am anymore, I do you? Know. You're right, because I have this really bad habit where I'm looking at someone's face on the camera, but not actually the camera, because I'm so used to just looking sure. at someone's but, face. But let me challenge you. Let me challenge you. You just mm. said, I have this bad habit. Mm. It's not a bad habit. It's a normal behavior that you are seeing a face on a screen and therefore you want to look at them and connect with them. What you've got to just say to yourself is, OK, but I've had to learn that to, when I'm doing stuff virtually, they don't actually think I'm looking at them when I'm looking at them. Yeah. <laughs> they only think I'm looking at them when I look at the camera. Mm. So I wouldn't call it a bad habit. It's just like it's a normal thing that happens. Yeah. That makes Kind sense. conversations like... with yourself. Right. Yes. I'm telling you, this is your I daddy and you help or your granddad. Yeah. <laughs> Right, I'm telling you off. Yeah, no, I know. For sure, for sure. Uh, my partner always tells me off about this. Um, okay, <laughs> so I'm going to do my best. So I'm trying to look at the camera now. Um, yeah. And, and The thing is, I don't know, because I'm looking. I'm, I'm still looking at the camera as well. So Oh, hilarious. Can, I'll, you look at the camera now, and I will look at you on the screen and give you... And now I think you're looking at me. Oh, this is so strange. I always forget to do this, which is, yes, yeah. this is the camera. And yeah, uh, now, now you're making really good eye contact with me. Aha. Uh -huh. OK, I, I'm staring so at one, the dot. One tip for you, maybe above the camera, put a little post-it note with yes. a face and a smiley face. And remember, I'm talking to the post-it note. Yes, you're right. I think I definitely need to do that because it's just sort of a natural thing to start drifting downwards and looking at someone's face for sure. And that's is. actually, I think you, you were talking about this, which is like, is there such thing as like over preparing? Yes, I think um, we can become, we want to try and eliminate our nerves at times. And I think, and we like to feel in control. And that gives the brain a certain degree of, all oh, right, I'm in control here. And, and there's not, and we don't like uncertainty. We don't like unpredictability at yeah. all. And so, we can, in a, in a desire to deal with our nerves, we can then over-prepare and over-control everything. And that's yeah. why particularly over-preparation can be write everything down. But, but I think sometimes then you lose the human connection, you lose the flow and the energy, you become more mm. robotic than human. And I think also for me, so I, you'd sent me the questions that we we're going to discuss. And you said, there may be some others. We may use some of these, we might not. Mm. But I have gone through your questions. I went through them a couple of times just to get some food for thought in my own mind. Some of the questions you've asked haven't mm. been asked by, of me previously. But I'm not writing detailed notes about every single one because also I want to be present in the moment. Yeah. And I want to respond to what you're saying. And sometimes I might say something like that phrase, the enemy of excellence is mm. not mediocrity. The enemy of excellence is being fairly good. I hadn't prepared to say that. <laughs> but so at, the lucky. Most, at that time, it just felt an appropriate one idea or, you know, quote to draw upon, to share with you. Mm. And so I think if I've overprepared, I'm, I'm almost like being handcuffed to a script Whereas I like the script, not that I've written one, but I'd, I'd like maybe some of the pointers I want to maybe put over. I want it to be like a handrail rather than mm. a handcuff. So it's a guide to take me in a certain direction. But I want to have some flexibility within that. Whereas if, I'm, if it's like I'm handcuffed to this script or to these slides, I think you can lose a sense of sponsor. sponsor I'll even get, learn how to say this right. I'm the guy that wrote a book called How to Speak to People Really Listen, and I can't even say the word spontaneity <laughs> first time round. Oh, it's how hard. <laughs> <laughs> it, no, to be fair, that is a difficult word, and you can't say <gasps> you. You, you can't say spontaneously, spontaneously. Funny enough, you just can't. It's hard. Yeah, you've got to get your got get. You've got to get your lips working and your tongue grooving in a certain way. You totally but, do. So I think, you, the, again, can you over-prepare? Yes. Why do you over-prepare? Because you want certainty. And mm. I think we have to appreciate sometimes flexibility is required. Excellence is great to aim for, 
but your pursuit of being perfect, I think, can cause more harm than help. So would you say you need more preparation if, for example, you've got a really short period of time to present something to your workplace or something? Interestingly enough, you're spot on. Mm. But if you said to me, Paul, can you do a three hour seminar? Right. Literally in the next 10 minutes, I'm good to go. Or I've often done virtual events which have lasted two hours. We do about an hour and 10 minutes then have a 10 minute break, then do another 40 minutes. And, and I'm like, yeah, I'm good to go. If you said to me, Paul, can you do a seven minute presentation? <laughs> I'm going to go, I can, but you're going to just have to give me some time to prepare that. Yeah. Because I don't yeah. do that so often. And because you could almost ad lib a bit more and go off piste a bit if it's a three hour but now I've only got seven minutes. Yeah. Oh, my days. Every word counts. And the question becomes not so much what do I say, what don't I say? So, indeed, sometimes those shorter presentations actually require more preparation. But the mistake people make is they go, well, normally I'd be speaking for half an hour, but I've only got 10 minutes. And what do we do? We try and communicate half an hour's material hmm. into 10 minutes and it doesn't work. So you have to really look at your material and go, okay, what is the key stuff they absolutely need to know here? Mm. Not what, and it's almost like, what must I say and what might I say? Right. And it's like in our conversation today, there might be things where I think I definitely want to make that point. So that's a must. But this other point, maybe that's a might. Mm. And can you actually, in a corporate setting, do you think you can add like those kind of stories that you mentioned, which were really funny, by the way, uh, and also visual aids without it being like seen as inappropriate? I think what we've confused, we've confused professionalism and boring and corporate. Mm. They've all become this mixed up mantra that if it's being professional and corporate, we have to be serious mm. and there's no opportunity for the human connection. I mean, I'll talk about how I use this prop with this happy, smiley mask and go, <laughs> you know, so need to be happy. Um, and, and we need to sometimes drop the mask metaphorically. Mm. I use an illustration in my, because I do a lot of work around resilience and well-being, and I'll say we're a bit like this last it band and we get stretched and we need to be stretched. We need to be challenged. Mm. But we need to build in recovery and rest, stretch and rest, stretch and rest. The problem is for some people, we can be stretched too far for too long yeah. and not have any recovery. And then what happens? You snap. Now, that's an elastic band. It's a prop. Mm. But straight away, it helps people visualize things. I talk about ah. one of my um, main my main ideas is about, remember, the beach ball. Yeah. And you're looking at something now from your perspective, and this beach ball could represent a metaphor of an issue or a challenge that we're discussing, you and I. And from your side of the beach ball, you're seeing red, yellow, and orange. Hmm. But I'm looking at the same thing as you, and I don't see red, yellow, and orange. I see three different colours. Oh. And, and sometimes we need to shut up thinking our perspective is any perspective. There isn't. Move on and see where other people are coming from, because now you've moved on to see where I'm coming from. You see, oh, he, he's, he was looking at blue, white, and green. Hmm. So we're looking at the same thing, and we're seeing it very differently. But maybe sometimes when we have more beach ball conversations we'll see all six colors rather than just three now that's a prop love it i'm not trying to unpack the beach ball as a metaphor too much with you but mm -hmm. what i'm trying to say is i people think in pictures and stories connect if you were to do mri scans of your brain when i'm giving you facts mm -hmm. and then mri scans of your brain when i'm also telling a story you'll see that there's more brain activity when i'm telling a story Hmm. The beach ball is now, and those of you who are listening rather than watching, so six colours to the beach ball, but you could only see red, yellow and orange, but I'm seeing blue, white and green. We're looking at the same thing, but we'll see it differently. Now, hmm. the fact is, if you're watching this on YouTube, by immediately seeing the beach ball and seeing how I used it, that makes what I've just said more sticky and more memorable. Hmm. Definitely. In fact, also, to be fair, than to those that are listening to this podcast from audio yeah, totally from higher audio. <laughs> so you look for I look for how do I make my message sticky and memorable and so props are powerful whether it's the elastic band the beach ball the happy mask 
but also stories, stories stick. Mm. And perhaps what we've always thought about at times, particularly in the corporate world, is I'm just trying to communicate to people's heads yeah. and give them knowledge and facts and figures. But people don't change. People don't get inspired by facts and figures. Mm. They get inspired also by stories, by having a vision. You know, Martin Luther King, who many would say, um, wrote, you know, said one of the greatest speeches ever yeah. in, in human history. He didn't say, I have a strategic plan. <laughs> he said, I have a dream. And so he communicated with people's hearts as well as their heads. And, and I think in the corporate world, we think that, that stories and anecdotes are for the world of fairy tales, that mm. they are for the world of the workplace, let me tell you. See, that's amazing because this is slightly off topic because I just kept thinking it throughout the entire book as I was reading it. And I was like, have you ever thought of joining like a campaign trail yourself? Like, do you know, after all, like most of the notable politicians are the ones who gave like the best speeches. So I was like, have you ever thought of it yourself? I'm, I'm not strongly enough politically affiliated to want to go mm. on any kind of campaign trail. I will say that one political party, I won't, remember, won't mention which, did approach me probably over probably nearly 15 years ago to work with their leader. Um, and then their leader was dis deposed. <laughs> I was going to say disposed, but no, they were not <laughs> disposed. But no, oh, but gosh. they were they actually were asked to step down. And so there was a chance that I was going to work with someone that if I mentioned, in, certainly if your listeners and viewers in, in the UK, you would have probably heard of this politician. And the, so that almost happened. But I do get an interest in politics, particularly American politics, mm. because I'm less emotionally involved in what's happening in America. I am fascinated by how people communicate their message. And mm. Joe Biden, for instance, yeah. when he was he was asked a question about Joe, tell us about your views on gay rights. Now, he didn't give a fact. He didn't just say, I believe this. He said, let me tell you a story about when I was about nine years old. And, and, and he was talking about going to this, um, I think they've been to the swimming pool, him and his father and, and one thing. And he tells a story. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is that was a podcast. I listened to, you know, often two podcasts a day. Wow. That was probably from about four months ago. But I could tell you this. I could tell you what Joe Biden's views are on gay rights and what mm -hmm. his father said to him. Why? Because he framed it within a story. So communication fascinates me. Donald Trump fascinates me. Lots of people hate him. I'm not exactly going to be a cheerleader for him at all. But I think we are we miss we miss a trick if we just demonize people mm. because of their ideology uh, or their theology. I think we need to sometimes go, OK, but what's their method? What is it about? Mm. Why was this guy who had so much you know, bad stuff associated with him? But what was it about him that managed to connect? What was it about someone who basically was the equivalent of Alan Sugar in America, you know, hosting the TV series, your, you know, uh, The Apprentice, and he became the president? I know. Nuts. How on <laughs> earth did that happen? And there's lots of sociological reasons why, but also there are things that you could study about Donald Trump and go, you might say, I dislike every fibre of his being. Hmm. Fair enough. But he got elected. He and second time round, he got, although he lost, he got more votes second time round than he did when he won it. Yeah. And you kind of go, the guy's maybe a bit smarter than some people give him credit for. What were his communication strategies? You can take the strategies, not the values from various people. Yeah. Definitely. For sure. Because look, the strategies worked. Clearly it worked. So, yeah. you know, yeah. oh, sad but sad. true. There's something, to, something oh. in that. There is, and it, and it is sad but true, because sometimes the people who are persuasive are the ones that have got good, effective strategies in their toolkit, and they know how to, in a sense, work an audience, play an audience. They, they tap into our, our fears, our anxieties, our anger, mm -hmm. and that connects with us more than people who communicate to our heads and our intellect. Mm -hmm. You know, Al Gore should have knocked it out of the park and become president of the United States yeah. in 2000, but he didn't because it was almost like he knew too much about his subject and he was yes. the, intellect, the intellectuals, not to the average person on the street. Yes, you're absolutely right. There's so that I think that could be put across so many different scenarios that's happened in the last like five years for sure. 
Um, totally. Facts didn't make a difference. It was the stories you say, which is so true. All the visual aids you could even say. <laughs> oh, yeah. Messages on buses, on billboards. <laughs> they don't have to be true to stick. No, indeed. Indeed. Fascinating. Again, maybe one day, Paul, we might see you as the next prime minister of this country. You <laughs> never know. You never know. I think you do know. And the answer's you won't. You won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been but, oh, a unless moment. that's the sumo party. Maybe it's the sumo party. I won't join Labour or the Tories. Maybe I'll mm. maybe I'll set my own party. Yeah, you never know. The Paul McGee you, party. You, you're head of communications, okay? <laughs> oh, hilarious! Love that. That's that's hilarious. <laughs> hey, but you, but now, just again, just joking aside, we're having a great conversation. Um, you're coming over, whether you feel like it or not, as really confident and relaxed. Oh, thank God. And yet maybe there's that voice inside your head telling you that you're no good. I, this is not an experience I'm having with you that would indicate you really struggle. Oh, this God. is super relaxed. And I'm not being patronising. I'm just giving you some feedback. And I think and that, I'm saying that to you, but maybe I'm saying it to all of your listeners as well. There's more to each one of us than meets the eye. Mm. I think sometimes your biggest, that you like this one, you'll have to listen up good to what I'm saying, but you like this next line. Sometimes your biggest enemy is your enemy. Yeah, completely. Your biggest enemy is your inner me. Inner me, like it. Inner yeah. me, yes. Your yes. inner me can be For your biggest sure. enemy. Oh, so oh that's giving you so much to think about. I it? know, completely. It's just like blown my mind slightly. <laughs> I'll be pondering on this for a week now. Uh, and also, I I'm going to try something quite new with this time's podcast episode, which is I'm going to start with a story because I really want to try out the method. That's the whole point. So, yeah, I'm, I've got a lot of food for thought from this book. It's right. absolutely excellent. You don't have to even call it a story. Do you know what mm. I mean? Say, let me tell you about something that happened to me last week. Or I was oh, yeah. 30 years old. Mm. I was at school and Billy, and then this happened. Or so-and-so said this to me. You don't have to frame it with, I'm about to tell you a story. <laughs> yeah. Get into it. Do you know what I mean? But <laughs> yeah. stories do stick. But when people hear the word story... They automatically at times think, you know, and we all lived happily ever after. Mm. But actually, when you're with your friends, um, having coffee, having a drink, having a meal, we're all full of stories. Mm, totally. Then don't translate that into sometimes a work setting. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. That's exactly it. I will be very careful to not mention the word story. <laughs> and uh, Paul... I'm like, huge thanks, huge, huge thanks. Excellent, excellent advice. Uh, I Yeah, lots of food for thought. Um, and yeah, I, I, is there any final words you want to give us? Like the, the, the final words are if you want to make connections with me, people can reach me. Um, probably the easiest way is via Twitter and Instagram um, at The Sumo Guy. You can also go to my website, thesumoguy.com. So if you just put sumo guy in your browser you're going to stumble across me one way or another most of my books in fact all of my books are available on amazon and um my youtube channel you can also access that via my website and that gives you maybe just some additional stuff on other areas of life not just in speaking and communicating that you might find of value so it's been my pleasure and i hope that you and, and your listeners and your viewers have got some some little bit of a gem that is of value to you, either in your work or in your personal life or both. Mm -hmm.